Good morning, and welcome to worship at Asylum Hill Congregational Church. Asylum Hill Congregational Church is an open and affirming congregation within the United Church of Christ. I'm Reverend Tracy Mayor Muska, the Minister for Mid and Later Life, and we are so glad you're here with us this morning. Well, needless to say, it has been an interesting week, and we are glad that you're here with us. With whatever emotions you find yourselves with today, you are welcome here. This time, I hope, brings you a sense of belonging and connection and hope. It is fun for us to know who is tuning in with us, so I invite you to open a new tab on your browser and sign in using our virtual pew pad, which can be found at ahcc.org. Also, on our website, you can find a link to submit prayer requests that we um, take into consideration throughout our week and pray for those things that are heavy on your hearts and minds. There are a lot of fun and enriching things happening at the church um, this week and this month, so please be sure that you are receiving and reading those Friday emails. We are depending very heavily on those emails to get information out about some of the fun events and programs. So you can find more information in those emails as well as on our website about some of these events. So at 1 p.m. today, we are doing our weekly community dinner in our parking lot. And we continue to hope, we hope to continue doing this as long as it is possible. We invite you to join us on Wednesday evenings for our ongoing Bible study that we are doing on the Book of Mark. Tune in for an amazing Zoom discussion about a film documentary entitled Without a Net, The Digital Divide in America. Beth Bai and Jay Williamson, Jay Williams are joining us next Sunday to have a discussion about this important film. And also, you can get silly with us by joining us for an improv comedy workshop that we will be holding on Zoom, thanks to CT Comedy uh, Theater. So that will be happening on November 18th. So please don't miss any of these fun ways to connect with one another, even if it is just virtually. I promise you will have some laughs, you will learn something new, and you will um, increase your sense of connectedness during this strange and unusual time. So this Thursday, on November 12th, there is an important action happening with the Greater Hartford Interfaith Action Alliance, GIA. If you, we, if you would like, to, we would like to seek commitments from our legislators and from Governor Lamont on important issues. Specifically, we're talking about the repeal of welfare liens, clean slate legislation, and declaring racism a public health crisis. Please RSVP to Pastor Jordan if you might be available on Thursday night and want to participate in that action. It is really important that we have a lot of representation so we can show how important these issues are to the constituents in Connecticut. Um, we also want to make sure you're aware of the fact that on Thanksgiving Day, we will be offering a community dinner to our neighbors at 1 p.m. in the parking lot. If you would like to contribute food or funds or your volunteer time, please reach out to Kyle and she can help you connect with those ways to uh, support our community during this challenging time. Um, so you'll also learn in that Friday email about some of the fun things happening during Advent, which believe it or not is coming up pretty soon. So in that email, we'll be talking about the virtual women's Advent retreat, Advent in a Box poinsettias, the virtual angel tree, and more. So please do find ways to connect and celebrate this Christmas season in new ways, but in also in fun ways. Um, this is also just a reminder that we are intending to hold our 30-minute in-person worship service. It follows this service of worship. That service will be at 1015. If you are interested in coming in person for that worship service this week or in future weeks, please know that there are um, some protocols that we're following to ensure that everyone in our community remains safe. All of that information is available on our website. Don't forget that you can watch previous services on our YouTube channel, and please follow us on Facebook and Instagram to find out more about what's going on and to see some pictures from some of the programs and events that we are running. So let us now transition our hearts and minds to a time of worship and prayer.
please join me in the responsive call to worship. On this day, we celebrate our country and our service members, those who served in wartime or peacetime, those who served enthusiastically or perhaps with conflicted spirits, those who served one day or those who served until retirement. On this, On this day, day, we honor, we honor the, families the families who patiently, patiently and faithfully, faithfully support, support those who serve. We, we grieve with those who have lost, lost loved ones in war. war. And, and we, we pray, pray for those for whose loved ones returned, returned injured, physically, physically emotionally, emotionally, or spiritually. spiritually. While we celebrate our nation and our service members, we also recognize that our feelings might be complicated, and we sometimes wonder who to trust or what to believe. We hear, we hear the siren, the siren calls, calls of, those of those seeking to mislead, to mislead us. us. We hear, we hear voices, voices trying to anger us, incite us, us, and undermine our love. We see binaries being created and the expectations of unquestioned allegiance. We witness increasing polarization and discord, even within biological families, beloved friendships, and church communities. This, this day, day forward, forward, may we, may we make, make service, service to, to God, God and neighbor, neighbor our priority. Our this day, this day forward, forward, may we open, open our, our hearts and spirits, spirits to grace, grace and, goodness. and goodness. This, this day, day forward, forward, may we live our, our lives, lives with hearts, hearts full, full of love and justice. And justice. Amen. Sunday with you all. So, hi Tom, how are you? Hi, Eric, I'm great. Good <laughs> to see you. So, I wanted to ask you um, first, I, I know that you have served our nation, you are a veteran yourself, and um, why did you decide to serve? Tell us a little bit about your story. Well, the, the easy answer is I was drafted into the United States Army, and 
I had <clears throat> just started a new job with Edna. I had a new wife. We lived in a new city. And then I got my draft papers saying I needed to report. And a friend called me from Dayton, Ohio, where I grew up, and said he had found a reserve unit uh, that I should fly home and we could get sworn in, because that was a different type of service. And I said, great, so I flew home, and we're on our way to get sworn in. I said, by the way, what branch of service is this? He said, oh, it's the Marine Corps. I went, geez, is that the best you could do? He said, no, it's really good. We get to go to an island for training. I said, yeah, that's Paris Island. You know, they, they, they eat their young. Are you kidding me? And then he never had to go to the service. He was in a car accident, and by then the lottery had come in. And I went to Paris Island in 1969. And by spent, myself. By myself. Spent three months there, three months in Camp Lejeune for infantry training, and um, learned about the military perspective. And this was during Vietnam, it was hot and heavy. And I decided to serve, but I didn't want to go active service because of all the other things in my life. And the reserves, you do six months of active, five and a half of inactive, weekend summer camps and all that. And But I served six years. So. I guess I'm considerate of that. Well, thank you. Thank you for your service. My pleasure. Um, what, can you talk to us about what are some of the things that you learned? What are, what are some of the lessons that you took away from your time uh, in the Marine Corps? Well, one thing I learned in the Marine Corps, I mean, I had been involved in college sports and everything, so I, the physical part of it, I was pretty well prepared for that. But it was learning the military perspective. I mean, in Paris Island, you know, these are, they're training people to be warriors. And they have a certain method of doing that. And it's very physical, and it's very demanding. And you kind of learn where they're coming from because after the boot camp and the training, a lot of the guys in the platoon I was in were going to Vietnam. And they were going to be walking around in rice paddies and looking for Vietnamese and protecting, you know, their rights. And, so I learned to appreciate why they were as hard on us as they were, and me being a college grad, and there was a few of us who were college grads, we ended up coaching and teaching the other guys in the platoon to help bring them up to speed, because some of them had lied about their age to get in, some of them were barely even 17 years old, but they wanted to you know, serve. So in that way, I did feel I could give back by helping train some of these guys. Mm. So. I know you, Tom, uh, years later um, as a member of Asylum Hill Congregational Church. And I know you as a man who has a deep love of service and a man who has a, uh, a deep faith. Um, I would love to hear um, how do you sense that your, your time in service um, sort of in, in, um, in parallel or in tandem with your deep sense of faith, mm -hmm. how have those two things really shaped who you are today? Well, my, my faith journey really started when I married Dougie in uh, 1968 because her family had a very strong faith background and I didn't, wasn't raised in that kind of environment. And as we started our new lives with Anna in St. Louis and Dallas and Chicago, as we moved around, we'd always join the church. So I was exposed, we got involved, we served on committees, and so I was growing in my faith. And I guess one of the things that I wanted to do was give back. And I had a thought back in 2002, I had read where Jimmy Carter and his wife Rosalind were gonna build 100 houses in South Africa where apartheid had started. And I called my friend Don Shaw and I said, we need to go, we need to go be part of this. So we went and Jimmy Carter was there and Miller Toller, the founder of Habitat, Desmond Tutu, people from all over the world, 3,000 volunteers were there to build 100 houses in this place called Cato Manor, uh, where they, apartheid had started and they had bulldozed it out and we built 100 new houses. And the feeling of working with people that were going to live in these houses and the sense of service was overwhelming. And I said, I like that feeling. I want to do it again. And I did. I went to Carter Projects in Haiti twice, Mexico, India, um, other places in the world 
in the service. And then I got involved with Habitat in Hartford and have been doing Habitat for the last 30 years. I've been involved with church committees at Asylum Hill, whether it's stewardship, youth, or whatever. So I found that was something that uh, was very rewarding to me. And the more I did it, the more I got back. Tom, thank you so much. Thank you not only for your service now, but for the service that you provided to our nation. Um, we are grateful. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. Thanks so much to Tom for sharing one of the many amazing stories of the veterans in our midst here at Asylum Hill Congregational Church. Thank you for your service. And as we approach God in prayer, we lift up the people in our church family who need God's special consideration today. We pray for comfort and healing for Nancy Sinsdaden, Linda Pendergast, and Dave Lender. We continue to pray for peace and comfort for Bill and Katie Nixon as Bill remains in hospice care. We pray for consolation and comfort for Joanne Kidd upon the death of her daughter, Pam. We pray for unity and justice for our country as we move forward after this contentious election. And we ask for God to bring peace and reconciliation to broken relationships and communities. We pray prayers of blessing and gratitude for Larry Little, who will be celebrating his retirement after 30 years of working at Big Y and Wallbaums. Congratulations, Larry, and thanks for all that you do for this community and for our community more broadly. We ask for God's blessing and peace upon those who are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use disorders. And we pray for parents and teachers and school administrators and children as they continue to navigate these challenging times and schedules and fears of COVID-19. And also we lift up all those in our nation who have contracted COVID-19, especially as we face unmitigated illness and uncertainty. And now we're gonna hear from two military veterans from our community who will offer a Veterans Day prayer. Let us pray. God of all, as we move from Election Day to Veterans Day, we are made aware yet again of the blessings of our democratic republic and the freedoms we enjoy. We celebrate our constitution and civil rights guaranteed by the Bill of Rights. Today, we take time to honor those who have sworn an oath to protect and defend the Constitution, knowing the risks and sacrifice involved. God of mercy, you have called individuals to defend the human family from oppression, tyranny, and evil. Since our founding as a nation conceived in liberty, countless American men and women have stepped forward to defend our nation from aggressors and to liberate those held captive. Please let every veteran of our nation's armed forces know they are loved, respected, and valued. Let no one feel forgotten or neglected. Let every man and woman, young or old, feel the deep and enduring gratitude of our nation and its inhabitants. You loving God, know that it can be difficult for a person who has returned from battle or a stressful military service to reintegrate into normal everyday life. You know that the veterans can feel isolated and alone even in the midst of their friends and families because there are few around who understand their experience. So I ask you to place in the path of our veterans those who understand or strive to understand that they feel less alone. Remind them often that while their fellow human beings may never fully comprehend, you see, you know, you identify with them in everything. God of healing, you know how deep a veteran's wounds might be. You know the loss that many of our veterans feel in body and soul. You know the memories that haunt them and the scars that many of them continue to carry. Please bring healing to those veterans who still hurt. Please grant patience and wisdom to those around them who cannot understand, but can sometimes help the healing process. 
Please help connect them with resources that might help in their continued emotional, physical, and spiritual healing. God of compassion, please turn your gaze to those men and women who, who in their military service have sacrificed time, comfort, strength, ambition, health, prosperity, for the peace and safety of their family and friends and others they have never even known. Please reward them for their sacrifice and service. Almighty God, you know every veteran by name. You know their deeds, their hard work, and their perseverance. You know their needs, both material and spiritual. Please draw each one closer to you and grant them all the peace and passes and understanding. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And as we approach this time of offering, we take time to celebrate the faithfulness and service of some of those affiliated with this church community. We take time to feel gratitude for those who have protected and defended the constitution of our country and the democratic republic that, it, it, that gives us voice. We rejoice that God calls people to public service to advocate for justice. We celebrate new beginnings glass ceilings shattered, and our nation's resilience. Generosity flows from gratitude. Generosity helps us to forgive and to heal. It helps us make peace in the world, and it helps to bring justice and mercy to those who need it most. Our gifts this morning are one way we prepare for God's coming into the world in the most unexpected ways. Let us gather our gifts together now and offer them to God in gratitude. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have received. In return, we offer the fruit of our labor and the skills you have given us. Use these gifts to spread justice and love. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading for today is from the book of Joshua. And Joshua said to all the people, Now therefore revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods of your ancestors that they served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. God, may your holy word for us reveal itself today through written and spoken word. Amen. So here are some of the headlines from the last few weeks. Listen for some consistent themes. Public opinion about the coronavirus is more politically divided in the US than in other advanced economies. Americans are divided on whether colleges that brought students back to campus made the right decision. Voters' views of McConnell and Schumer are negative and deeply divided by partisanship. Partisans in the U.S. increasingly divided on whether offensive content online is taken seriously enough. I could go on and on. What do we hear? What we hear in these headlines is division and polarization. We seem to live in a world of binaries, and we are given the impression that we have to de declare loyalty to one side or the other. Abolish the police or militarize the police. No gun regulation or confiscate everyone's guns. Closed borders or open borders. But many of us find ourselves not on the extremes, but somewhere in the middle. Well, since we're in the political season, let's talk about one controversial issue, abortion. This issue seems straightforward, right? Look at this picture. You are either pro-choice or pro-life. But look here at this graphic. Yes, there are a percentage of people who would like to see abortion legal in any circumstance, shown in the dark green on the left. And there are some who want to see Roe versus Wade completely overturned, shown in the orange. But what you see in the middle is interesting. These are all the people whose views are somewhere in between. Many of us recognize the nuances of life, but it is hard to explain our position on a bumper sticker or in a Twitter post. And despite the vast gray area between black and white, patriotism is another issue that is often seen as binary. You either love our country or you want to destroy our country. You are either loyal or disloyal. And sadly, when we are critical, objective, discerning, when we actively identify ways that system and climates can be improved, when we blow the whistle or challenge the status quo, we risk being incorrectly identified as disloyal. But we know, like everything else, patriotism and loyalty to our country is far more complex. 
We can ardently love our country without being naive or unreasonably nationalistic. We can support and applaud our military while recognizing the cost that military service has on service members and their families. We can ask hard questions of our leaders about morally fraught missions and policies that are sometimes conceived and executed. Loyalty is far more than flying a flag or wearing a lapel pin. And my initial reaction, maybe yours too, is to cringe when I hear the word loyalty these days. I think of a blind allegiance that takes into cons no consideration to anything other than the interests of the object of the loyalty. I think of a resistance to change, a putting down of the other, and a glorification of one's own position or paradigm. Let's say I'm not really feeling that loyal to loyalty. But then I think of my loyal dog, Kingston, who is so dedicated and faithful to me. I remember my loyal friends who have been by my side even when I made mistakes and failed them. I think of my family's loyalty to one another, always lifting one another up and supporting each other through thick and thin. Maybe loyalty doesn't have to be a bad thing. Retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Cleon Rayner says this, loyalty means commitment to a cause, a purpose, or a person. It embodies the ability to stand behind one's promises and convictions. Loyalty does not waver in a time of test, but garners strength from within to stand committed to support the person, the belief, or the cause, despite whatever challenges may come. Loyalty is a deep and unwavering commitment to something important, and it can and does play a positive role. We hear it invoked in the context of military service, but it is also important in public service. In both military service and public service, officials are called upon to serve the greater good. They are invited to look beyond their own interests and agendas to pursue policies and strategies that will create the most benefit for those who they serve. In military and public service, people are called upon to engage in self-sacrifice and put others before themselves. In each realm, the gifts of diplomacy and humility are necessary in order to achieve objectives and to keep people safe. Loyalty to the public good is at the root of each. Asylum Hill Congregational Church member Rush Jones offers an example of loyalty. Out of loyalty to his country, he went to Vietnam during the Vietnam War. Night after night, for a full year, he slept in a cot in a damp tent, fighting his fears, exhaustion, homesickness, and discomfort. He sacrificed so much, a part of his life, his sense of certainty, his own ego, his own well-being, and his own hopes and plans. To be a loyal public servant, he faced extreme discomfort and put others before himself. The issue of loyalty is a central theme in our scripture reading from this morning. It's a topic we urgently need to consider during this trying time in our nation's history. In the passage we read, we hear and see Joshua striving to be a faithful public servant. As you might know, Joshua was a military leader of the Israelites after they left Egypt, and he became one of Moses' most trusted leaders. Joshua was later chosen by Moses to be one of the 12 spies sent to scope out Canaan. And Joshua was eventually chosen by God to replace Moses after Moses' death. In this section of Joshua, in his farewell address just before his death, the people ask him if they must be loyal to the God of Israel. God says rhetorically, seriously, people, God has given us everything God promised. And you're wondering if God des deserves our loyalty? And then he says, well, for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Where do our loyalties lie? We have many of them, our family and friends, our church, our nation, our well-being. 
There are many things which are deeply, to which we are deeply and justifiably committed. Among all of those things, I invite us to join Joshua in prioritizing our loyalty to God. You might wonder what that means. So some of my students at Wesleyan would struggle with this common image of God as an overly anthropomorphized figure who functions like a whimsical and unpredictable chess player, moving pieces on a chessboard. They found that very disturbing. So I invited those students to practice using the name Spirit of Love when referencing God inviting them to see God as the spirit of love within us, around us, and between us. In response to God's love and loyalty to us, we, like Joshua, are called to prioritize our love and loyalty to God, not out of fear, but out of awe and reverence and gratitude. Loyalty is a choice. When we choose to prioritize our loyalty to God, to the spirit of love, we are choosing the path of love. But first, remember what I said about loyalty and what we saw in some of those examples. It is hard. It requires us to put the greater good above our own immediate needs. It requires sacrifice. It requires us to be uncomfortable. In these challenging and hopeful times, let our loyalty to love, capital L, manifest in two ways, in empathy and in action. First, empathy. If we, like Joshua, prioritize our loyalty to God, the spirit of love, we are called to dig deep to discover empathy for others, even those with whom we fervently disagree. Again, I offer my necessary and important disclaimers. Discovering empathy for others does not involve exposing yourself to abuse or harm, or rushing to forgive someone who has been hurtful, or ignoring the very real harms of racism, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, sexism, classism. Having empathy does not mean we superficially agree to disagree or that we don't challenge misinformed or harmful opinions that others may hold. It doesn't condone toxic thinking or enable bad behavior. Discovering empathy for others, though, does compel us to acknowledge the humanity in all people. It involves a willingness to hear the stories of others and to recognize that others are as complex and multidimensional as we are. Empathy asks us to engage with others with the same curiosity and generosity with which we would hope to receive from others. Like us, their pains and struggles, their failures and unrealized hopes, their disappointments, their contexts, their parents and mentors all help shape their beliefs and worldviews sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse. So here's an analogy. When I hear people talk about salvation and faith, I sometimes hear them say, well, God wouldn't punish someone for not being Christian if they were born and raised in a place where there was no one there to teach them about Christianity. And I think that's true. And that also must mean that I may need to give some grace to the person who is raised in a household or in a community or even in a church that has inclusiveness or to feminism. Yes, there are some who will refuse to learn, whose hate is so baked in that their redemption is unlikely. And there are some people whose toxic beliefs affect us too deeply, and we must protect our own spirits and well-being from harm. And I also believe that there are others out there on the other side of the aisle, political or philosophical, who, if we show kindness and empathy, might open their hearts to think differently, more generously, and more lovingly. In his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie says this, You can't win an argument. 
You can't, because if you lose it, you lose it, and if you win it, you lose it. Hearts are not likely to be changed by a Facebook post or by categorizing people as ignorant or deplorable. Hearts are won through relationships of transparency and trust, where authentic conversation and growth can happen. The foundation for that is empathy. Nelson Mandela consistently role modeled a loyalty to love through his empathy for others. He was imprisoned for nearly 30 years in South Africa for his advocacy for justice, and he had many reasons to be bitter and angry and resentful. As the eventual president of South Africa, he ended up with powers that entitled him to vast amounts of revenge and retaliation. But instead, he showed kindness in order to foster reconciliation. In one instance, when Mandela heard about the death of the son of one of his prison guards, he reached out to offer sympathy and support. Having lost his own son, he was able to relate to that guard's suffering. In fact, Mandela also helped this guard find employment and was a true friend to him, a relationship described in the guard's book entitled, My Prisoner, My Friend. Mandela saw the humanity in others, and he used that to find love in his heart that allowed for much-needed personal and national reconciliation. So in addition to striving to discover empathy for others, our loyalty to love, capital L, love, calls us to action. Scholar and pastor Barbara Brown Taylor said this, anticipatory hope is not enough anymore. Participatory hope is the only kind that works now. I want cleats, not ruby slippers. Proactive engagement is essential. In 2018, Stacey Abrams ran for governor of Georgia and lost the election by a mere 55,000 votes. There was evidence that her opponent was successful in part due to racially motivated voter suppression. Instead of giving in to resentment or despair or hopelessness, she allowed her loyalty to love to motivate her to create the nonprofit Fair Fight to combat voter suppression. The work she has done through this nonprofit, while working alongside other voting rights organizations and nonprofits, inspired nearly a million eligible voters to register to vote in Georgia. Her loyalty to love helped reverse policies that were dis disproportionately disenfranchising voters of color. She recognized the harm that was done and transformed it into action for justice. There's an artist named Angie King who is a mother and teacher. Like many of us, she has wondered how to explain this election and the division and discord in our country to her own children and to her students and she created this piece of art. The daughter asks worriedly, what if they lose? The mother gently replies, then we keep fighting for the rights of all people. And the daughter asks, and what if they win? And the mother said, oh dear girl, it's the same answer. We all have work to do. Maybe this election was not meant to tell us how hopelessly divided we are. Maybe it wasn't meant to injure our spirits by reminding us of the vast support for policies that we consider racist or hurtful. A landslide on either side would have reinforced our beliefs that we don't need each other, that the other is expendable, worthless, beyond redemption. Instead, maybe the closeness of this election is a reminder to prioritize our loyalty to the spirit of love, even if it is uncomfortable and difficult. The closeness of this election implores us, begs us to recognize that we have a lot of important work to do, action, and we cannot do it alone, empathy. Choose this day whom you will serve. If you pledge your loyalty to the God of Israel, you are making a pledge of loyalty to love itself and all that that entails. 
May it be so. Amen. The Apostle Peter said this, Finally, all of you have unity of spirit, sympathy, love for one another, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay with a blessing. It is for this that you were called. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with each of you today and always. Amen.